We want to welcome today Dr. Michael Waters. Dr. Waters is a university distinguished professor in the Department of Anthropology and director of the Center for the Study of the First Americans at Texas A&M University. He is known for his expertise in First American Studies and Geoarchaeology. He is actively involved in the study of Clovis and pre-Clovis archaeological sites, including the Deborah L. Friedkin, Galt, Hawkeye sites here in Texas, the Manus site in Washington State, Paige Ladson in Florida, the Anzic site in Montana, and Wally's Beach located in Canada. Hmm. Currently spearheading research at Hall's Cave, a well-studied paleontological site in the Texas Hill Country. Waters received the 2003 Kirk Bryan Award and the 2004 Rip Rap Archaeological Geology Award given by the Geological Society of America. Hmm. I did a fellow of the Geological Society of America in 2004. I would like to thank Dr. Waters for presenting here today, and I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Hi there. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, participating. So uh, today what I want to talk to you about is uh, the first Americans and uh, that'll lead then into a discussion of the Deborah L. Friedkin site located in Central Texas. And as you probably all know, one of the, you know, uh, most contentious debates in American archaeology, there are several, but one of the biggest ones is the topic of the first Americans. It's, uh, there's a lot of debate about who these people were, where they came from, when they got here, and how they dispersed across the landscape. And we've been trying to investigate this issue for over a hundred years now. And you know we're slowly but surely making progress. So what I wanna do first off is just provide you a little bit of context so that you can see where the Deborah L. Friedkin site fits in to the uh, People in the America story and the contribution that it has made. Okay, well, if you were to ask a, an archeologist, uh, you know, before 1927, how long people had been in the Americas, they would tell you, oh, maybe 4,000, maybe 6,000 years. However, there were some archeologists and geologists who were thinking, well, there's, there's probably people were here much earlier than that because there's just too much prehistory in North America and South America to cram in 6,000 years. So one group from the Denver Museum of Natural History eventually found the Folsom site near the little town of Folsom, New Mexico. And here they discovered extinct bison remains associated with a very distinct projectile point, which is shown here uh, to the right. This is a lancelet type point with a distinctive flute that runs up the middle of it. And these are well flaked and eventually became known as Folsom points you know, because this was a type site. Now, back in the day, there was, there was no absolute dating techniques, no radiocarbon dating. So they had to rely on geological estimates. And in 1927, they estimated that the Folsom site was somewhere between 10 and maybe 15,000 years old. So today we realized the Folsom site, because of the advances that were made in the development of radiocarbon in 1950 through 1960, that you know, the Folsom site actually dates around 12,500 years ago, maybe 12,000 years ago. Another discovery occurred shortly thereafter in 1934, and that was the discovery of Clovis. There was a, a gravel operation in uh, near Blackwater Draw, New Mexico. And in this quarry, periodically mammoth bones would be found and mammoth carcasses and associated with them were large lancelet fluted projectile points, much more robust, bigger, fluted differently, made differently than the more delicate Folsom projectile point. Scientists you know, studied these uh, discoveries at Blackwater Draw and eventually defined what they called Clovis, which you know, was associated with mammoth. Again, in 1934, there was no absolute dating techniques available to us. And a geological estimate made by Ernst Antevs estimated that the geological deposits containing the Clovis artifacts were somewhere between 12 and 13,000 years old. Today, we know this particular site probably dates to maybe around 12,800, 12,900 calendar years before present. 
One interesting thing is that at some point in time, uh, after additional work was done at the at this Clovis locality, the type locality for Clovis, eventually fossil material was found in a bison bed stratigraphically above Clovis, pretty much confirming that Clovis was definitely older than Folsom. Now, over time, more and more Clovis artifacts and sites were found across North America. It took another 20 years to fully define Clovis. It really wasn't defined until about the mid 1950s by E.H. Sellards and others. And then Clovis after that became known as the oldest archeological complex in North America. In other words, the basal stratum of American archeology. span So just to digress for a minute, we have to ask ourselves, well, what is Clovis? Clovis is an archeological complex that is recognized by a distinctive set of tools and technologies. This is a definition I use. This is the definition that was proposed by Bruce Bradley and uh, Michael Collins. And uh, some people oftentimes refer to Clovis as a culture, sometimes as an era, but I think it's best to refer to it as an archeological complex characterized by this distinctive technology. Because we really don't know who Clovis people were. But anyway, Clovis people had biphase technology. In other words, they would take a fine grain material, usually chert or chalcedony or some kind of flint. They would bifacially work the, uh, the stone and then just keep working it down, you know, maintaining the width and maintaining the length uh, of the biface and making it thinner and thinner to eventually they produce the final finished Clovis projectile point. Clovis people had blade technology that you can see in the lower left-hand corner there. Clovis people would develop or make uh, specially prepared cores. And from these cores, this would be the platform, they would drive off long standard flakes right here that you see that we call blades, okay? The technical, technically a blade is just a flake that's twice as long as it is wide. But in this case, when we talk about blades, they were purposely made like that from a particular blade core that was fashioned and made to drive off those kinds of, of uh, flakes. Now, blades were particularly useful tools because of the fact that you could just use the sharp edges, you could snap them in half and use the sharp edges. You could modify the ends of the blades and produce end scrapers, like you see two spurred end scrapers off to the right. And, uh, or you could flake the edge and turn this into a knife. So they were very versatile tools, you know, much like a Swiss army knife. Finally, Clovis was characterized by an osseous technology. By osseous, we mean that they used ivory and they used antler and they used bone. And they would shape this bone into various, or this osseous material into various types of tools. One type of tool is the one that you see right here. And what that is, that's a bone projectile point. You can see where it's been beveled at the base here. This is for inserting into a half, and this has been sharpened to a tip. In addition to that, several Clovis rods have been found at various archeological sites across North America that are beveled on both ends. Here you see one here and one here. And this beveling, Nobody really fully understands what it was for. Some people think these rods were lashed together to form you know, staffs. Other people say that these were used for hafting Clovis projectile points. So we have them, but we don't fully understand what they're for. But at any rate, there are other types of osseous tools that have also been found, including bone needles uh, you know, made out of uh, osseous materials. The next question becomes, how old is Clovis? And, and this is something which has taken a while to figure out because finding, you can find a Clovis site, but not every Clovis site you find is datable by the radiocarbon method. And there are really now only about 13 or 14 Clovis sites that have material that can be radiocarbon date, dated and have been radiocarbon dated. And when you date these artifacts, you know, you date this material, usually charcoal or bone from the site associated with the Clovis artifacts, you find that Clovis consistently falls into a really narrow time window from about 13,050 to about 12,750 years ago, or just about a 300 year time window. 
it's been suggested that Clovis may even be a little older than this, but there is no firm evidence whatsoever of uh, an older Clovis site. So the big question now is, is were people here before Clovis? Because, you know, there's a lot of questions now. I mean, we only find Clovis in North America and it's a real short time period. How did these people, you know, get all the way to the southern tip of South America so quickly? And so there's a lot of debate about pre-Clovis sites and a lot of them have been shown not to be archeological sites or were much younger than proposed. But they're really the first site to demonstrate very clearly that people were in the Americas prior to Clovis was a site in South America known as Monteverde. It's specifically found in uh, the midsection of Chile there, as you can see, almost along the coast. And this, at this particular site, they had structures. So here you see this kind of rectangular type structures that were created. There was another wishbone type structure. Uh, there were tools that were made out of wood and bone, but there were also lithic artifacts like this El Hobo, kind of stemmed projectile point that's shown off to the left. And these were all found, uh, you know, uh, close or right adjacent to the creek that you see off to the right, known as Chin Chippewapi Creek. And this particular site dated and has been dated multiple times to about 14,200 calendar years before present. In other words, a whopping 1,200 years before Clovis. But what about North America? There are early sites in North America, and I'm going to take you to a couple of those right now. And that's these sites occur right here in central Texas along a little creek known as Buttermilk Creek. And in the very headwaters of Buttermilk Creek are the Galt site and the Debrail Friedkin site, which is located just slightly downstream. Both of these are located. Uh, in the upper headwater areas of the stream. And, but then yeah, as a geologist by training, I, I always found this kind of hard to believe that these old sediments would be preserved there. But after I thought about it, it made perfect sense to me because this upper headwater area is where you're gonna get sediment storage of really old sediments where you might find old archeological sites. Uh, here's what Buttermilk Creek looks like in the lower right-hand corner. You can see it's just a small drainage. Uh, it's spring-fed, and above is the floodplain adjacent to Buttermilk Creek. Well, what did, why did people come to Buttermilk Creek, and, and why did they stay there once they got there? Well, it, it's, it's pretty easy to see why people came to Buttermilk Creek. The first off is that in the upper headwater areas are gravity springs. So there's always a constant supply of fresh water, one of the key things you need for survival. The other thing is that Buttermilk Creek, at least this particular area of it, is right on an ecotone. You can hunt and, and search for plant resources up on the Edwards Plateau. You can go down to Balcones Escarpment and hunt and gather down on the Blackland Prairie, or you could even go down to the coastal plain. So there are abundant plant and animal resources within close distance uh, of this particular archaeological area. And then finally, the other thing that really attracted people was high quality lithic material for making stone tools. And at the Galt site and at the Friedkin site, there are outcrops of the Edwards limestone. And within the Edwards limestone are seams and nodules of Edwards chert. And those arrows are pointing to several nodules. You can kind of see one here, you can see one here, and there are other nodules over here. And those nodules uh, are, are basically excellent chert. And here's one of the nodules off there in the lower left-hand corner, you can see. And when you flake this, it, it produces very, you know, excellent conchoidal fractures and was used all through time uh, to make prehistoric artifacts. In fact, it was traded and moved out of the state in many, many different directions. So at this one particular locality, we had everything. We had water, we have game, we have uh, materials for making your tools, you know, everything that you'd need to survive. Well, Buttermilk Creek, you know, first came to light uh, in the late 1920s when uh, Pierce excavated here with the University of Texas. And he excavated a large burn rock midden that was present on the Galt site. 
And his purpose was to try to define you know, part of the cultural chronology and project a point sequence for Central Texas. And this was a great place to do this because of this great burn rock midden. Little did he know that underneath his feet where he stopped digging would be found some of the oldest archeological material in Texas as well as in North America. Well, just to kind of show you, I could talk a little bit about the Galt site to show you how we ended up at the Friedkin site. Uh, in 2000 through 2002, you know, Michael Collins was spearheading excavations at the site and he invited Harry Schaefer uh, who was then uh, in the Department of Anthropology at Texas A&M University. He's now retired and in San Antonio uh, and working at the Whitty Museum. And uh, so Harry and I teamed up and, and we conducted excavations uh, at the Galt site. It was just as, it was quite a treat. It was just an enormous Clovis site, probably the biggest site, Clovis site I've ever seen. And, and I have 500,000 artifacts here for the Galt site, but I'm sure I know over a million artifacts have already been recovered from uh, the Galt site. We had the good fortune of excavating next to a, uh, an area that was, was known as the Lindsay Pit. This was a stock tank that was excavated. And here you see our excavation underway uh, back in 2000-2001. And uh, what we found here was a Clovis workshop. And the Clovis workshop was, it's a stratified locality with paleosols, but down here at the very base was a Clovis workshop. This was a gravel bar on which people sat. This would have been a small depression at the bottom of the workshop. This then would have been a, a kind of a, a gravel bar coming off the slope where people could also sit in Flint Nap. Down in these lower deposits, we found dense concentrations of lithic materials. You had everything there from bifaces to overshot flakes to big flakes to blade cores to blades and broken blades and broken projector points and broken preforms, everything that you could imagine with Clovis lithic technology. Uh, so it was just a, a pleasure as well as a, a privilege to work at this particular site. Uh, what it finally turned out is that in the central portion of the site, there was a hearth and there was a huge napping station on one side of the hearth and a huge napping station on the other side of the hearth. And, and in fact, the concentration of lithic material was so great that in places you had flakes and other artifacts just resting on one another without any kind of uh, sediment in between them. Now, we tried to date this archeological site using radiocarbon, but that wasn't possible because of the fact that we didn't have any uh, collagen preservation in the bone. And also too, we didn't find any charcoal. And any charcoal that we found were basically from roots. This is the you know, biggest problem in dating archeological sites in central Texas. So we turned to luminescence dating, which I'll explain in a minute, and from the Clovis horizon, we obtained ages ranging from about 13,000 to about 12,900 uh, years before present. Well, let me fast forward now to 2002. The initial investigation of the Galt site was coming to a close. And we had been working primarily on the south side of the creek, but we wanted to find out what in the world was on the north side of the creek. So uh, Mike Collins got a backhoe out there and we dug a long trench. And when we dug this trench, we found that there were floodplain deposits, you know, not as well defined as the stratigraphy at the Lindsay Pit and elsewhere, but it still had the same sequence with archaic artifacts and eventually Clovis material being found. And then down below this, we continued to find artifacts. And, and the question was, was there a older than Clovis or pre-Clovis occupation at the Galt site? Again, luminescence ages, you know, pinned the Clovis horizon about 13,000 years ago. And the older material was dated to around 15 or 16,000 years ago. Well, to make a long story short, eventually 
you know, Mike Collins was able to get access again to the property and uh, donated it to the Archaeological Conservancy and start the Galt School and continued to work up here at the Galt site. And I'll talk about that near the end here. I found another locality downstream, which was known as the Deborah L. Friedkin site. It was sitting on the north side of the creek, just like the initial discovery area and where Collins was conducting excavations at the Galt site. And uh, uh, it seemed to have a very similar floodplain history to it. So it was an excellent place to search for the early components there. And we worked there off and on since 2006, all the way through about 2016, over a number of field seasons during the summer. <clears throat> Where we ended up excavating primarily was up here uh, in what we called Block A, okay? And in Block A, it was located on a higher terrace above the river channel of Buttermilk Creek. And this was an area that would receive, you know, basically overland flow once in a while. In other words, whenever there was a large discharge coming down the river, the river would over, the creek would overtop its banks and dump uh, fine grain sediments. Okay. And this is what led to the creation of the Deborah L. Friedkin site as we know it. What's really interesting is at the site, we recovered probably, goodness gracious, I'm sure almost 800,000, maybe a million lithic artifacts, most of them being flakes throughout the entire sequence, but there's still a terrific amount of artifacts. And, but what we found at this site is we found over a hundred diagnostic artifacts and, and oops, found over a hundred diagnostic artifacts. And uh, essentially up at the top section, what we found is we found late prehistoric artifacts, primarily these types, Perdiz type projectile points. Below this, we found late archaic and Sir Edgewood and Casterville type points. Below this, we found some middle archaic material. Below this, we found early archaic wells, hoxy, angostura, typical early archaic diagnostics. Below this was a zone where we found late Paleo-Indian artifacts such as Angostura, Golandrina, Dalton, St. Mary's Hall. Below this, we found Folsom material and eventually Clovis material. The Folsom material is characterized by typical Clovis uh, fluting uh, fragments as well as uh, broken Clovis, uh, Folsom projectile points. And in fact, these, you can see the distinctive kind of uh, flute failures here. These particular uh, points were found very close, well, not close to one another, about two meters apart, but they were found within about one centimeter vertical distance from one another. So in other words, what I'm trying to say here is that as we excavated through these deposits, I could almost predict what in the world we were going to find as we went deeper and deeper. Below the Folsom was Clovis, okay? And you don't find this much where you find a Folsom uh, component overlying Clovis, I think this is probably the third locality with such a thing. We found Clovis bifaces with overshot flakes. We found Clovis bases and midsections. We found blades. We found uh, flute flakes that came off of Clovis projectile points. And so we found it enough of the Clovis assemblage to clearly tell us that Clovis was here. We continued to excavate and lo and behold, what do we find? We continue to find additional artifacts in this zone of the floodplain deposits as we dug deeper and deeper. And this we dubbed the Buttermilk Creek Complex. At some point as we dug down, there was a, we continued to dig the floodplain deposits all the way down to the bedrock here, but no artifacts were found. Now, as you can see, looking at this particular, you know, deposit, you know, behind the, the yellow bars that you see there, there's really not a good clear stratigraphy here. And I want to just explain how this developed. What happened is at some point in time, the bedrock was exposed. It was a bedrock bench. Every time Buttermilk Creek would overtop its banks, it would lay down layers and layers and layers of clay and silt. And then this continued all the way through time. And as this was occurring, people would come and camp on the locality. 
their campsite would get buried. People come back to the same locality and camp, their camp would get buried all the way from the very earliest time period through the Paleo-Indian all the way to the late prehistoric time period. Okay, so how do we know how old this is? Well, again, like I mentioned before, there isn't anything that we can radiocarbon date. You know, we found some bones up in the late prehistoric occupation, and I thought, well, maybe we might be able to date those, but lo and behold, guess what? They're leached of collagen, so we couldn't really date them. So again, we turned to the luminescence dating technique, and, and I got my colleague Steve Foreman to come. He was at the University of Illinois at the time. Now he's at Baylor University. And he uh, obtained about 78 OSL or luminescence ages from the site. And these ages were obtained, not just kind of one here, one there. We did four columns across the site. One of the columns he's putting in there and below it on the lower right is another column. And this allowed us to check and see if we had a, a, an undisturbed stratigraphic sequence. And also, too, it allowed us to correlate ages across the archaeological site. So lo and behold, what do we find? The dates matched up quite nicely with the diagnostic projectile points. You know, the, the late prehistoric material was about 1,000, early archaic, 7 to 9,000, 9 to 11,000 for the late Paleo-Indian periods, 12 to 13,000 for Folsom as well as Clovis. And this older material was dating somewhere between about 14 and 16,000 years old. We place it roughly between about 13,500 and perhaps 15,500 years before present. Now, no artifacts were found in that lower deposit. And we got OSL dates from that. And they range from 32,000 to 18,000 years ago. So no one was home at that time. It wasn't really until about 16 to 15,000 years ago that people first discovered this archaeological site. But what do the artifacts look like? What's this Buttermilk Creek complex look like? Well, we have over 100,000 artifacts, of which about three, 400 of them are tools. And we have a, a great number of bifaces. Here's some of the bifaces here. We have preforms that were being made into projectile points. We have larger size bifaces. Uh, we also have what we call discoidal cores. Here's a discoidal core with flakes being driven off in different directions. And we also have, whoops, sorry. We also have the, the flakes that were driven off these discoidal cores. Uh, we have expedient tools, as you see in this row. This is a concave scraper. This is a little burin. This is just a retouched flake unifacially retouched flakes here. We found hematite. This is probably the biggest piece that we found, a piece of ground hematite. You can clearly see the bevel here and still had the grinding marks on it from its use. Here's a bifacially worked um, uh, flake fragment. We also had blades like you see here and blade fragments, as well as bladelets, which must have been coming off of small bladelet cores. And then we also had some really interesting things. We had some burins as well as a lot of radially broken tools. And if you look here, this particular flake has been, has been broken into a rectangle. This biface has been burinated to produce this sharp edge over here. And in fact, here's a broken edge on the other side of this spoke shape right here that has a radial break on it. And these are really nice. Uh, we've done a lot of experimental work on this as well as use wear analysis on this material. And we've discovered that these were used as planing tools. You can hold these little flakes in your fingers, between your fingers, and you can plane uh, wood, uh, antler, bone, ivory material, and it works quite well. It's so useful, it's almost like a wood plane. You know, when you use a wood plane, you get that piece of wood that comes up in, a, in a, like a ribbon. And the same thing happens when you use these kind of radially broken tools, you get that ribbon of material coming off the bone or the antler. So they probably were utilized uh, to make osseous type tools, okay? And also too, we've done a lot of use wear analysis and this use wear analysis shows striations and polishes on the, on the edges as well as the corners of these tools, which were also used for grooving. Well, for many years, we found, you know, fragments of projectile points, midsections, you know, other midsections. We found tips. 
we found this odd kind of, of uh, kind of stem base, but we really didn't know what to make of it until about 2015 when we found this Finnish projectile point down in the lower 15,000 year old component of the site. It turns out that it's a stem to projectile point, you know, expanding out into a lancelet type form. I was very surprised myself when we found this because I thought, well, it only makes sense that the precursor of Clovis would be uh, some sort of a lancelet point. I never suspected that we would ever find a stem point, but we did. Uh, we did a lot of dating around that particular projectile point and a few other ones. And again, they came out around 15,000 years BP, okay? So, and all these fragments that we had before all started to make sense once we got a complete point. So we got lucky, and uh, which is part of archeology, span you know, it's hard work and luck, I guess. But at any rate, <coughs> excuse me, above this in a little bit younger deposits, we found this form, which was kind of a triangular type form. Uh, it appears to have some small anion thinning associated with it, but you can clearly see where it was hafted right here. Okay, it was hafted about right there. And it had been resharpened multiple times. It was starting to get a little bit of a bevel on it. And, and so, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So this is an interesting little point that was found still in the pre-Clovis deposits, but a little bit higher up in the sequence. Going back to the Galt site is uh, Mike Collins opened up an area known as Area 15 on the north side, very close to those backhoe trenches that I showed you. And he has worked there for about 15 years. And uh, finally has backfilled the excavations and they're, under, under, they're doing a lot of analyses now. <clears throat> and he basically had the same sequence with late prehistoric and late archaic materials middle and early archaic artifacts and projectile points, late prehistoric material. Below this, Clovis, a sterile zone, which is just wonderful. And then he had additional artifacts in a zone in, that he called older than Clovis. And in the older than Clovis zone, he found bifaces as well as projectile points. So here's the tip of a biface. You know, he also found blades and blade cores, as you see here, some of which have been modified into end scrapers. He found expedient tools like this graver, and he also found these projectile point bases, which are a, a stem-like form, which would fit in, you know, with the stem-like forms that we're finding at the Friedkin site. The thing I love about the evidence that we have from Buttermilk Creek is that we had two teams working. We had one team working at the Galt site. We were working down uh, at uh, <clears throat> the Friedkin site. And we found the same stratigraphy dated to the same time period, utilizing different people to date that stratigraphy. And uh, we were able to also independently demonstrate that below Clovis horizon was, this, was a very early archeological component. Okay, well, you might ask yourself, well, this is pretty neat, but you know, does, does, does the Galt and the Freakin site just show up in isolation? And it's just an isolated discovery down in uh, central Texas here. Because if it is, that seems kind of odd to be out there by itself. We already talked about Monte Verde to the south, but if you go up to Washington state, you have the Manus site, almost 14,000 years old, with the tip end of a bone projectile point embedded in it. You go up to Canada in southern Alberta, you got Wally's Beach, which dates around 13,300, where you have no Clovis projectile points, but you have evidence of horse and camel butchering. You go over to Oregon over here, and you've got Paisley Caves in Oregon, dates roughly around 14,100 years ago, where you have human coprolites as well as artifacts. And most recently in Idaho, just adjacent to uh, to the Paisley Caves in Oregon was found a Cooper's Ferry site dating roughly to about the same time period, 14,400, 14,300 calendar years before present. Wisconsin, we have material. We have mammoths, two mammoths associated with bifaces, you know, dating 14,500 to 14,800 years ago. 
perhaps Meadowcroft Rock Shelter. There's still a lot of questions about the ages. But another site that I worked on with in Florida with Jesse Halligan was the Paige Ladson site. And there we found flakes and a biface associated with mastodon remains that we could really date quite well utilizing the radiocarbon method and clearly showed that these artifacts are almost 14,600 years old. So I show you this slide for two reasons, to show you that the Friedkin and the Gall sites are not found in isolation. The people were definitely scattered across North America by 15,000 years ago. And the other interesting thing is that they were all using biface blade and osseous tools. Now I wanna use this slide as a, uh, a, to bring my talk to a close here because I just want to show you how, again, the Galt and the Friedkin sites kind of fit into the story of the peopling of the Americas. And if you look over here on the left-hand side here, this is time going from 13,000 years ago, KA is just the abbreviation for 1,000 years ago, all the way to 18,000 years ago. And I want to draw your attention here because what you're looking at there is there's, in the last 15 years, there's been a terrific amount of genetic work done. And this genetic work, you know, at the genomic level, not mitochondrial or Y chromosome DNA, but the genomic level, looking at the human genome, has really showed us uh, the population history of the first Americans, but also their estimates place the peopling of the, the initial peopling of the Americas at around somewhere between 17,500 and 14,600 years ago. What does the empirical archaeological evidence tell us in North America? So this is the North American record. This is the South American record. Okay. Well, oops, sorry. Um, what this shows us here is that one of the oldest sets of archaeological material that has been found so far is at the Friedkin, sorry, at the Friedkin and the Galt sites. In addition to that, you've got the sites in Wisconsin, you've got Paige Latson, and you've got uh, Paisley Caves, and above here you've got Wally's Beach and you got Manus. And then at the top I've shown showing up around 13,000 years ago is Clovis, and we didn't talk about it, but you can easily find Western stem uh, projectile points of the Western stem tradition coeval with Clovis in the Great Basin. In South America, the earliest evidence that we have is again at Monteverde and another site known as Waka Prieta where uh, Tom Dillahay excavated. And eventually around 13,000 years ago, you see fishtail points being made across uh, South America. So I, what's, what's gratifying to me to see is that um, what we're seeing is a good concordance between the genetic evidence as well as the empirical archeological evidence. We're seeing that sites are now dating older in North America than South America, which makes sense because people have to get into North America first and then push their way to the South. And the other thing that's really nice too is to see that, that Texas has been providing very, very important information about the first inhabitants of the Americas. In other words, they provided some of the earliest evidence of, uh, of people being in the Americas. They've also provided us with some of the, uh, a huge assemblage of artifacts that these people left behind. And in addition to that, as I, the reason I mentioned Clovis a little bit at the beginning of this talk, it's also provided us with a terrific amount of information about Clovis as well. If you'd like to learn more about the First Americans, I encourage you to visit uh, the uh, website for the Center for the Study of the First Americans. There you can find a couple of good summary articles on peopling of the Americas. You can see what kind of field projects we're currently doing. And if you uh, want to, uh, we put out a quarterly news magazine called the Mammoth Trumpet. And we have a lot of those Mammoth Trumpets, oh, pretty much all of them up online, except for the most recent issues that you can peruse and learn from. So with that, I'll just say uh, thank you for listening. And it was a pleasure to be here and uh, to be a part of this uh, lecture series. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Waters. Uh, I really enjoyed your presentation. If uh, any of our viewers have a question for Dr. Waters, please uh,
place your question in the comment section below. And that concludes our presentation on the Deborah uh, Friedkin site. Thank you.